Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to this week's episode of the Legal Beagle Podcast. We have gone international. This week, I am joined by a guest all the way from Oslo, Norway. His name is Erling Anderson, and he is the founder and creator of Advocat Guiden. Did I say that right, Erling? Perfect. I got a thumbs up. It's more uh, easy to pronounce the lawyer guide, which is actually what that stands for. This is a legal platform that Erling and his team has ro have rolled out across uh, Norway, and they're ready to roll this out now across Europe, and hopefully one day we'll see it here in the United States. Erling, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Jonathan. So my understanding is that you are a serial entrepreneur. You had a social media network that you had built and then sold in Norway. You have a, I think it's a uh, digital, what is it called? Consultancy uh, called Omega Media that you have there. And, and you, at some point in your life, decided to also go to law school. How did you make all that work? <laughs> well, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I started a social uh, media company, kind of like Facebook here in Norway called beep.no. And that turned out to be a huge success. We gathered approximately 10% of the Norwegian population. And this was way back in 2006, 2007. So we were quite early. We were kind of competing with Facebook uh, going global, but unfortunately Zuckerberg beat us. <laughs> um, but um, then we sold it for $12 million in 2008. I was 25 years old, <clears throat> uh, got a lot of money. I think the, the, the English football player, George Best, said it best. He said that I used uh, half of the money on hookers and drugs, and then the, the rest I just squandered. <laughs> <laughs> How did, um, why, why didn't you, at, at that point, just call it a day? That would be everyone's dream, to be able to retire at age 25. What, what prompted you to, to jump back in and, and develop another company after selling off your social network? Uh, well, I kind of discovered that I was miserable um, with just money and no, um, no, nothing to, uh, nothing to dream about. Really, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, when especially in the IT field, I think, um, I think the journey is, is more valuable than the destination in a way. So, starting something, working on it, uh, doing your passion every day—that's what counts. So, after a few years, I decided to go uh, back. Um, into the IT startup world and then I started my own company and um, the reason why I became a lawyer and later a, an attorney is because uh, I, uh, four years after we sold the company the Norwegian tax authority came after me and they wanted more uh, tax basically so in Norway we have a tax system which works pretty simple if you if you get a salary, you're, you're taxed approximately 50% of your salary, quite a high bracket. And then if you sell stocks, you're, you're taxed at 28%. So the point with our deal, the BIP.NO deal, was that a lot of the payout was contingent on us keeping uh, or continuing to work. It's called an earnout agreement. Lots of lawyers will know this term. It basically means that you keep working for some period, like one year, two years, three years, and then you get paid kind of a premium or at least some of the money that you receive is not paid out in full unless you keep working. It's kind of a, uh, a whip to keep the entrepreneurs working, right? So the Norwegian government saw that as me trying to evade tax law uh, because I, I taxed 28% because I was selling a company. And they said, hold on a minute, you're, you're, you have to keep working for at least two years. So that means that all of the proceeds from the sale should be taxed as uh, salary. Um, so they slapped me with um, a sal um, tax bill of approximately $500,000 extra on the sale. And I just felt that was completely unreasonable. So I hired um, an attorney here in Norway, one of the best. You know, I had lots of money so I could hire, afford to hire the best. And he, he wrote one letter and he charged uh, $15,000 for this one letter. It was like four pages long. And I told the guys I worked with, like, this is, this, this is probably going to take years to settle with the Norwegian government. We can't afford to go forward with this super exp expensive lawyer. 
I think I'll just, I'll, I'll do some courses on the university and I'll take over the letter writing and see where this goes. And then I completed law school here in Norway in half the time. It's usually five years. I took it in two and a half years. And then ultimately I won the case against the, the Norwegian tax authority. So I didn't have to pay anything. So, but you went to, you spent two and a half years in school so that you yeah. could argue your own case and prevail. That's fantastic. What a story. <laughs> well, I think yeah. most people probably fell out of their chairs when you said the tax rate on income taxes is 50% of your salary in Norway. Yeah. Wow. That is startling to hear because in the U S people argue that 20 to 25% is absurd. So to hear it's more than double that is, is a, a crazy number to just comprehend. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's quite high also, but you know, Norway is a social democratic um, monarchy and we do, there are some nice trade-offs for the high tax bracket, you know, free university, free healthcare, everything is free basically, which you get from the government. But of course you do pay for it uh, indirectly. So you go to law school and the intent behind going to law school was so that you could save legal costs on fighting the Norwegian government for this tax penalty. You get out of law school. Was there an intent to go practice law or was it simply to just defend yourself against this, uh, this tax case that the Norwegian government brought against you? No, no, it was just uh, self-defense, 100% self-defense. Uh, I didn't have any plan going forward to actually work as a lawyer. But when I got the, the degree, I was like, well, I should do something about this. And I, you know, I came from IT, so uh, I specialized in kind of IT law and actually uh, tax law because uh, obviously I, I came to learn quite a bit about it. So I was kind of a tax slash IT lawyer, which is a good thing to be uh, as a lawyer because it's, it's a high income bracket. You, you earn quite a bit if you manage to, to be successful in that area. So I worked as that for, I think, three years. Um, and then I, I kind of said to myself, well, it's been a good run. I, I, I feel it was immensely um, um, satisfying to work as a lawyer and, and attorney. But ultimately, I just wanted to go back to IT and startups and do, uh, do stuff like that again. So why the lawyer guide? What did you identify in the marketplace that was missing? Why did you bring this concept to reality? Well, the thing I realized, you know, I came with IT background into the law, law uh, legal field, and I talked with so many colleagues, I was asking them, like, how do you do client recruitment? And they were all telling me, well, we do this the, the normal way, the way you're supposed to do it, by going to conventions, doing talks, writing articles, doing word of mouth. And I'm like, wow, that's insanely antiquated way of, uh, of getting new business. I mean, it's like, uh, they were more preoccupied having the right uh, business card than doing anything online. And I tried to get people to like go online and just have a presence there. And so many lawyers, especially the old ones, were telling me, you know, Erling, just relax. Nobody's using the internet to find a lawyer. And I'm like, oh my God, is this really happening? And people were so adamant that the internet did not work for client recruitment. Uh, so I just I kind of stumbled upon the fact that a lot of the legal industry is extremely antiquated in the way it deals with clients and in the way it deals with client recruitment, but also down to the, you know, the basic stuff. I don't know how it is in the States, but here in Norway, you know, the case handling systems are extremely old. Um, the way you do hourly billing is outdated, you know, uh, typically you come from a profession like if you have CRM systems like Salesforce, really good systems, uh, really powerful systems. But for some reason, those systems haven't really reached uh, a lot of the legal profession yet. So I just saw a huge um, gaping market opportunity. And also another thing I discovered going to the kind of the legal profession with the IT background uh, I kind of saw that a lot of the really successful lawyers were the ones who had been in the business for so long because you have to build up a portfolio, right? So that kind of shuts out a lot of the younger um, people. I didn't have any problems myself because I have a, a, a huge network and I came from like an earlier profession, but I felt sorry for the younger lawyers because they had to go the ranks. You know, you had to kind of work as a 
first a junior lawyer and then an associate and then, uh, or associate first and then junior lawyer and then work as a lawyer and you had to really build yourself up. It will take like anywhere from five to 10 years before you start making any real money. And you're really uh, living off the scraps of the older lawyers who like throw you a bone every once in a while. You know, here's a case, you can do this. I don't, I don't, I, I'm not, uh, I'm too busy to handle this case. So I realized that there was also a giant opportunity to create a more democratic um, and even playing field across lawyers. And then the last thing I realized, well, two more things, actually, if I, if I can add. One is the fact that there is very, very little transparency in the legal profession. You know, when you're in the legal profession, you kind of feel that you understand everything and you know all the big firms, you know, like, this is a big firm and this is a small firm and this is a medium firm. But when you're on the outside, you have absolutely no idea what a good law firm is supposed to be, who's big, who's not, who's medium, who I should contact. So, you know, coming from this outside, I just saw, wow, there's this small little world where a lot of lawyers think that they know everything and, and kind of they have positioned themselves in this internal hierarchy that nobody on the outside has any inkling even exists, you know? When I, when I, before I, I became a lawyer, I thought that all lawyers were the same. Like I could basically call this guy or this guy and I would, I would be um, as well off. It, it, it didn't, didn't matter. But of course, that's not the, pro, uh, that's not the case. So uh, it's really the transparency issue. Um, and then, of, of course, the last fact, which was really uh, fundamental to understand, is the fact that you, at least in Norway, and I do think in a lot of um, the world, you don't have any way of knowing how good a lawyer is until you hire him. And that's kind of what I discovered is I hired a super expensive lawyer to deal with my case. And he did a perfectly fine job. He was not the best lawyer I could get probably, but certainly not the worst. But, you know, I had absolutely no way of finding out that on beforehand unless I used some kind of network or, or kind of called around or something, you know. Well, you, you mentioned two things, Erling, that I want to uh, expand upon. One is the antiquated nature of this profession. I wholly agree with you. When I came out of law school, I had a business background. I wasn't a serial entrepreneur like yourself. I worked more in corporate America, but in, in, in bigger companies. But when I, when I did so, I thought some of those general business practices would transfer into this profession. And I was startled to find out how they don't and how how really much in the dark ages this profession is still today, even here in the States. Why do you think that is? Why do you think it's still so antiquated? That's a really interesting question. Well, I, I, I do think the legal profession is going to go the same way as pilots and cab drivers and everybody else, you know? Uh, my, my grandfather was a cab driver and uh, my mother used to tell me how much of a status position that was to have. He had like two cabs and everybody in my small hometown knew him. And that was a really um, highly regarded profession because it meant you had a car, you were your own contractor, you could decide your own hours, you were earning quite a lot of money. It was, it was like a, a, a kind of a big deal being a cab driver. But what happened was that there was an influx of people who wanted to work as that, of course, and their rates dropped. And now uh, probably only a few people are earning money in that profession. Um, and then that same thing happened with pilots. You know, you know pilots used to be a highly uh, recognized a profession, and to a certain degree, it still is. But the fact that is that it's been um, industrialized. It's been uh, there's huge competition between pilots, especially here in the um, EU, at least Europe, like pilots from um, um, Baltic states and stuff like that, taking um, lower wages and driving the reputation maybe of the business a little bit down. And I think the legal profession has been kind of an isolated, protected little nest, you know, of people with long education. It's impossible to get into the profession unless you do, you follow the, the, the ordinary route. And there hasn't been any kind of viable competition. And the people who run the industry, they haven't had any reason to introduce more competitiveness into the marketplace. Everybody's been earning a lot of money just keeping it the way it is, you know? So I think that's the biggest reason, like nobody has had the reason to kind of revolutionize the legal industry yet. That's an interesting point because here in Arizona, where I'm from, this just changed. This is the first 
state, I think in the entire country that is now allowing private money to participate in owning law firms. And, and that's a big, big issue here because for the longest time, to your point, it was, you could only own a law firm if you had a law degree. So there was a, a hurdle you had to get over in order to even own a law firm. And then there was this circle, this club, if you will, of people that were like, look, we all make a lot of money. Let's not rock the boat. Well, the, the rules changed here just recently. And in Arizona, for the first time, they're allowing now private investors, private equity, you know, just entrepreneurs like yourself to come in and say, look, I want to be a part of that. I think I can do it better. I believe some of the changes that we're going to see are similar to what you're envisioning. Even in Norway, I think you're going to see that here in the States. I think what you're going to see is this almost like a gig economy type approach where people are, yeah. they need lawyer. It's a service, right? It's no different than a car service. Like you're talking about your dad with the cab. It's no different than Uber. It's a service. And I think you're going to see that, that change. And I think people are not prepared for this evolution that is about to come. I think, I don't think people even see it. I talk to other lawyer friends and they're, they think I'm crazy because I look at things a little bit differently, but they, they certainly don't think that that's ever going to happen in their lifetime. And I think it's going to happen sooner than, than later. But my second question for you, Erling, about uh, something you were talking about earlier, you mentioned the word transparency. I suspect I know how you're going to respond, but I'm going to ask anyway. Why do you think there is a lack of transparency with this profession? Because I have my own thoughts, but I'd love to hear yours. Yeah. Before I answer that question, I just want to say something uh, which, will, which you will find amusing is that Norway is actually introducing the same legislation uh, as you have now then uh, next year. So uh, up till now, it's uh, only been legal for attorneys and lawyers to own uh, legal practices in Norway. But now they're actually uh, going to allow it from next year. Um, I think it's next year or the year after that. But anyway, very shortly, anybody can go into the industry. And the, the, the Bar Association has been fighting this, you know, like, like crazy. Because obviously they see what's going to happen. Like, private entrepreneurs are going to go in there and they're going to revolutionize the industry. They're going to hire lawyers, uh, paying them probably lower salaries, uh, unfortunately for, for us as lawyers, but that's just the way it's going to be, you know. They're going to hire them to lower salaries and they're going to streamline the products that are offered in a far better way than, than what's been done today. And if, I'll give you a small example. I'm sure you have the same in the U.S., when before I became a lawyer, I thought that every time you went to a lawyer and you got him to help you with a contract, he basically started from zero or at least, you know, from, from quite low. But then I realized it, this, is, this is a template industry. Sorry to say, you know, a lot of this is template industry. And the bad thing is I don't think the, the, the clients are, are paying for one or two hours to fix the template. Unfortunately, I think often a lot of the templates are passed off as kind of unique stuff or semi-unique, you know, and I don't think the full, the, the full price reduction is, is uh, fronted to the client, unfortunately. So, so I do think that a lot of that will change when the private um, non-lawyers go into this because they don't have the same uh, reason to protect industry as, as the traditional firms do. Uh, you know, it's funny, Erling. I don't, I don't think you're going to make as many friends among lawyers that are trying to protect those secrets, the seedy <laughs> underbelly of our profession. But I do think you're right. And I think people that are listening to this, and we have a lot of non-lawyers that, that follow our podcast and, and watch it, I think they're going to be pleased to hear that some of the stuff they've always had suspicions about is actually reality, which is there may be this absurd overcharge in services that are offered because of this template type approach. One of the things yeah. I loved about what you guys do, and I'm just going to call it the lawyer guard, lawyer guide, because it's easier for me to pronounce, but yeah. is you talked about, let's have the, the legal costs, let's have them right there so that people can see what they're going to be expecting. So there isn't this what I call it, this cloak of secrecy, you go into me with a lawyer, you have no idea. And all of a sudden they quote you $15,000 for a letter. And you're like, what? It, you, I, I, is it true that the lawyer guide now for the people that are using it in Norway, there, there is some transparency in terms of what consumers can see as the, the charges related to the attorneys that they may want to hire? 
Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, that uh, coming back to your question about transparency, that was kind of one of the uh, things that we wanted to pre improve upon is the pricing model, of course, because um, I don't know how it works in the US exactly, but in Norway, you go to a lawyer and you ask him, what's his hourly fee? And that actually depends uh, both on who's asking <laughs> and the type of uh, legal practice uh, you need help in. So a tax issue might cost more uh, per hour than a contract issue, you know? Um, so that really reduces the transparency in the industry quite a lot because uh, you might go to the same lawyer, two different persons get two different quotes. And the lawyers will always find a reason to justify that, just to be clear. <laughs> you know, they will always say, well, this is more complex or you're coming from this background and that's more complex. So I have to use more of my brain, you know. But to be honest, let's call it what it is. It's just bullshit, you know. Uh, it's just a way of making money. And um, the fact is that we want to improve on that. And we only, we only have the user in mind, you know. We want to create the best possible service. Doing that, we have to kill a few darlings, as they say. You know, we have to. So what we started doing now is we're given transparency on three different levels. If you're a cheap lawyer, a medium lawyer, or an expensive lawyer, uh, because that gives you some feeling of the price. But we are going to introduce even a stricter uh, approach to that, where you actually state your price on the profile. And that will be considered a binding offer from the law, from the lawyer to the general public. Uh, but um, of course, there's a lot of resistance to, to that uh, level of transparency. I love your candidness. I think that, so in the, the work that my law firm does, it's all uh, personal injury work. So it's people that get hurt. And I don't know how it's structured in Norway, but here the typical fee agreement between a client and our firm, it would be contingency. Basically, if we can recover something for the person that was hurt, we get a percentage of that. When I started, when I started my law firm and I built my website, I said, I'm going to put my fee structure on my website. And I had a countless number of attorneys tell me not to do it. That's a mistake. You're, and I was like, why? I'm, I'm being honest. This is what I'm going to charge. That way, when I'm talking to them, they could already see it on the website. We've already, I've given them examples of how that would, that fee may play out if their recovery was X. This is kind of, you back out the legal fees and this is what they would receive. People were really against me doing that. I think it was, it was the bare minimum that I could do. I mean, I, I think it's, why wouldn't you want to share what you charge? I can't think of any other business. Imagine going on to Amazon. We'll use that example and <laughs> going to buy a product and it doesn't tell you what you're going to pay until you check out. Then you get to know, I, I want this item, but I don't yeah. really get to know what it's going to cost until I'm at the checkout point And then I'm going to be told, I, I just don't think that's a fair way of transacting business with consumers. So I love the idea of transparency of this is what we charge. This is how we charge. And people walk in with an expectation because you're right. There has been this surplus of money that has accumulated in this profession because of this cloak and dagger type approach. And, and I'm probably not making friends either, but it's the truth of, of the matter. Yeah. And I, I, you're right. Every lawyer can justify why they charge, how they charge, and they have reasons for doing what they do. And I'm not taking away from that, but I think no. it does distract that level of transparency. Yeah, I mean, whatever you say and whatever way you, you kind of justify it, and, and as you say, I can totally understand why it's done and et cetera. But the fact that is that it's not consumer friendly. How, however you view it, it's not consumer friendly to withhold pricing until in a way it's too late for the person, you know? So, uh, so that's one thing we introduced. And then we introduced a kind of a filter where you can filter lawyers who give um, – uh, free consultations and free like first hour uh, free uh, so that you can kind of get the feel for the lawyer because in Norway some lawyers will not even give you anything free they're like from the minute I start talking I'm going to bill you <laughs> you know they even probably bill you for giving the price list you know so <laughs> <laughs> so that's the problem with the legal industry I feel is that it's it's quite traditional and it's quite secretive in the way it does business so the lawyer guide, uh, which you're getting ready to roll out internationally, there's a, there's a very close competitor, at least I would call it a close competitor of yours here in the States. Do you have any competitors in Norway right now? 
No, I mean, uh, to be honest, most, most of the EU or Europe is kind of virgin land with regards to competitors. Um, I know of a, of a site in the US called Avo, which That's is the one. similar. That's the yeah. one, yep. That, and we looked a little to Avo, but we really wanted to improve upon Avo. Because what I feel with Avo, uh, this is just something uh, from a guy standing outside and looking in, in, the, in a way, is that um, I, I feel that the transparency could be even better there. Because it's hard, at least I tried to find some bad reviews, but it was very hard. Uh, everything was kind of drowned out in a lot of positive stuff. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of lawyers there who have lots of positive stuff. But we really want to be just as visible with the negative stuff as the positive stuff. So we have a huge empathy, empath, empath sits on, the, um, on reviews, both good and bad, and the way we moderate these. So our, our moderation of reviews is actually quite unique, I would say. So uh, can you just uh, explain to me in, in a few words how the review system on AVO works? My understanding is that you can recruit your former clients to post reviews after the representation ends and then it gets posted and there's a there's a, a scoring system out of 10. So I think yours is a five star. Is that correct? Five stars? Yeah. Yeah. So in on Avo, it's it's 10, it's 10 points. You could be a 8.5 or a 9.0 or a, a 10.0. And the more reviews you get, combined with some other things, the higher your ranking goes. And the idea was supposed to be that you, you know, everyone should want a 10.0 attorney. The problem is, I don't know of anyone, general consumer, that really knows about Avo, to be honest, that would ever yeah. go there to post a negative review. If they're going to post a negative review, they're going to go to Google and post a negative review because Google has a rating service available for every business. And so they'll go there. But I've never had a negative review on Avo because frankly, I would never refer someone there that had a bad experience. I would try to resolve it internally, but I can't stop them from going to sites like Google. They've never, ha they've never heard of Avo. That's, that's the biggest challenge with Avo is I think they think they're bigger than they are and have more impact in the industry than they really do. Um, to be honest, um, the way that they do reviews, um, you just confirm my suspicion, is that that's a terrible way of doing reviews. And I'll tell you why, because it, it lends itself to lawyers actively rec recruiting positive uh, clients. You know, if, if you did a shit job for me, you're never gonna ask me to leave a review on Avo and you have to send me the link which will enable me to review you. So our system works completely differently. On our platform, anybody can review anybody. And what happens is, so imagine you, you're a lawyer and I want to review you. I go to your profile, I click leave review, I write a shit review of you. Terrible lawyer, don't use him, please stay away, uh, whatever, and I click send. Then what happens is that you are sent a notification on the platform, but we don't tell you the review, we don't tell you the score, we don't tell you anything. We just ask you to confirm, have you worked for Erling Anderson, yes or no? Nothing else. And of course, you can know that I'm not positive, but maybe you don't. Maybe you think I'm, I'm real, a real fan of yours. So you click yes. And when you click yes, we publish that review. And then you can see what the score is um, and what I'm writing about you. And then you can leave a, re uh, a reply to my review saying like, thank you for your comment about my work. I'm, I'm sorry that you're not satisfied. Um, please uh, contact me and we can try to resolve it or something like that, you know, just be professional. Uh, so what happens on our platform is that the reviews are actually a lot more truthful because you have both the good ones and the bad ones intermixed and there's no kind of uh, filtering on beforehand on who's positive and who's not. Well, I think that's a, a fantastic idea. And when I was reading about the lawyer guide, I, I recognized the verification process as a positive. Look, I don't want to be a 5.0 because I think any business... I'm suspicious as a consumer when I see someone who has all five-star ratings. You can't yeah. possibly always have five-star ratings. It's just not reality. So I want to be, so I want there to be a mix of negative reviews because you're not going to make everyone happy. And sometimes it's an opportunity for you to grow as a business and get better and, and improve. And, and I think when you try to filter out all the negatives, you give this false representation of who you really are and what you can really offer to the market. But 
I want to ask you a, a thought. I got a, had a client that had a bad experience and he found a service through Google that would spam my Google reviews. I was getting probably 15 negative reviews a day from just aliases. And I, you know, we called, I had a team of people get involved. I had, you know, we called Google, we had conversations with Google. They don't take reviews down because they have no way to validate or verify that this is an, an actual client or an actual customer of yours or not. And so I had to, the only solution, Erling, I'm not kidding. The only solution I asked Google, I said, see, what you're telling me is in order to counterbalance all these fake reviews, I have to create fake positive reviews. And they said, well, we're not encouraging that, but that's really the only way. I'm like, see, I said, I, Domino's Pizza, uh, huge companies don't get negative reviews at the clip I was getting them. I'm a small law firm. There's no way. These aren't real clients. And, and no. that's the, that was the challenge for me is I was frustrated. I don't mind a negative review. I think it's important for consumers to see what people say. I, you, I know you draw the analogy of, um, the lawyer guide to trip advisor. And I think that's a great analogy. I love reading the negative reviews because not look, if a hotel has 15 negative reviews out of a hundred, then that means they, they had some problems, but it doesn't mean that the entire hotel is a bad place for you to stay. But I read them both because I want to hear what people are talking about. A lot of times, frankly, the negative reviews are about something in particular that the hotel didn't do to someone's liking. It's not like the entire experience was ruined. They didn't, they didn't like something like, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, a, a meal in the restaurant. And so they, they posted that. I, yeah. I think it's great. I think it's great to have all that. What was frustrating to me, and I imagine many businesses, is when people that are just frustrated in general start taking out their frustration on a business and there's no relationship between the, the business and the consumer. Yeah. So we have an <clears throat> active uh, policy on that saying that you have to have have been represented by the lawyer in question. So if, if there's a false review on our site, you can complain and we will check it out and we will actually reach out to the client and ask him to send um, some kind of documentation showing that, he's, that you have worked for him. So that could be hour sheets, that could be a letter of uh, uh, commencement of the task, emails, whatever. And we also do this on fake reviews, but because unfortunately, even though we would think better maybe of lawyers, we do have quite a bit of lawyers who are actively writing lots of positive reviews on themselves, which is, to be honest, quite embarrassing when you're working as a lawyer. We should be better as kind of a profession than that. Um, so yeah, we try to moderate that. And of course, we are sensitive to the fact that some people might be leaving shit comments. And I'm, I feel the exact same way as you, even when you're looking at a really nice hotel, you know, there will always be some bad reviews. But you look at the bad reviews and often the bad reviews are come from bad people, you know, so you instantly kind of recognize it. Oh, yeah, this guy is complaining about like uh, the soup or something like this. And it's a five star hotel. Everything else is perfect. But this, this one soup made it a one star experience. You know, it's not very plausible. Um, but that's why that's why a good bad review is very important. You know, when somebody leaves a really thoughtful, bad review saying like, this guy, he blatantly overcharged me and I have documentation on that, or um, he forgot to appear in court, for example, or something, you know, really uh, uh, impactful, then that review can really guide other people from either selecting differently or at least clearing that on beforehand before um, engaging with, uh, with the lawyer. I love that. So how, how do you monetize the lawyer guide? Meaning how, how does it make money as a business? Because when I was checking out the website, I think there's a subscription service for attorneys. Is that the way to, to monetize it? Yeah, we have, we have two ways. I mean, the, the subscription service for the lawyers isn't really the focus in a way. That's something we offer to create a bond between us and the lawyer because it forces them to uh, commit to the service. Uh, we, so basically we have three kind of levels of engagement. First off, we list all lawyers in Norway on the platform. So everybody has their profile, if they like it or not. And then <laughs> that's very important because that means that we can receive reviews. Even if you choose not to have a relationship with us, we will still be able to receive reviews from your former clients. 
So that's kind of the basic level. And then you can claim your profile, which means that you can change the text, upload the picture, do some basic stuff on the profile. And that's free, that's totally free. Then you can also um, click these accept or reject the reviews that, that you receive. And then the premium profile is just, uh, it's uh, not too expensive, it's uh, $500 a year. And that gives you, uh, you can tag yourself for lots of keywords, you can add your legal categories, you can upload some information about your company, etc. So it's not too expensive, I would say. Um, and then, so that's one way of monetizing, but the other one is much more interesting. And that's we have uh, what we call a lead form. So consumers can go to us and they say, I need a lawyer dealing with divorce. He should be willing to do the first uh, hour free um, I'm a bit, I'm a business or a private person, etc. And they leave their phone number, email, name, and a little bit about what the case is about. And then we receive that as a lead and we send that out to maximum of three lawyers working with that specific legal category. And we charge them approximately $30 per lawyer. So basically you pay $30 and you get the chance of representing this man or, or female who needs help. So like a lead gen system, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's a lead yeah. Gen. Got it. So as you prepare to roll this globally, where's the next market outside of Norway? Where are you guys taking this first? Well, we're, we're taking it first to the neighboring countries like uh, Sweden and Denmark, um, because phase one has kind of been test the market, test the product in, in my home market, because that's a legal uh, market I know. Uh, but of course, Sweden and Denmark is like sister and brother countries to Norway. So it's a very similar um, setup. I think in Norway, there are like 5 million people. In Sweden, there are like 10. And then in Denmark, there's like seven or eight. I can't remember. Uh, so like phase one would be a market of uh, 20 million or so, a little over 20 million people. And then we are looking going into Germany, England, uh, France, Italy. And then um, ultimately our goal is the U.S. because I do think that Avo is not nearly what it should be and they deserve some uh, healthy competition. Well, I, I would agree with that. I don't think they have any real strong competition. And I think, as I said earlier, one of the, the problems outside of some of the things you've identified, Erling, is that the consumers don't even know that it's available. And, and I don't know if that's just poor marketing and advertising on their part, a, a, a poor way of messaging what they do. But it's not as if consumers think about them first when it comes to rating attorneys or even looking for attorneys. That's the, that's the problem. It's not like, you know, they, I think their intent is similar in the sense that they want to provide a platform for people to find legal representation and find a good person to help them with that. I think that there's just not enough, there's not enough awareness in the market and, 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 have you thought about how to do that and how to bring more awareness to the lawyer guide as you expand? Because I'll tell you, if I ask any non-attorney, they don't know who Avo is. You know, you know, because you're in the, in, the, in the business, but they don't know. So how do you plan to kind of uh, tackle that big problem? Yeah, so, uh, that's a million dollar question right there, isn't it? I mean, uh, no, but I agree with you on the Avo thing. I mean, um, we research so much before we stumbled across Avo. Like, we were, we were checking all the websites in the world, me and my team, like trying to find somebody to compare against and, and seeing what was out there whilst we were building our software actually, because we wanted to see how do other people and other countries uh, attack this problem. And then we found Avo by chance, but it was quite hard. And it doesn't seem like a consumer directed website, to be honest. It seems more directed towards the lawyers themselves, to be honest. Uh, for some reason, that's just my opinion of it, because they don't accept uh, reviews from anybody. You have to get an invitation from the lawyer themselves. So that kind of, in my view, kind of limits the, the attractiveness of the platform for the consumer. It, it makes it a whole lot more interesting for the lawyer, because then he can kind of control the reviews he gets. But that really detracts from the user experience of that website. So I think number one, we would be we have a more transparent model going forward, um, and we're also really focusing. Everybody does this, of course, but I do think that much of the struggle uh, is in Google, because um, um, a lot of people Google like you know lawyer New York or lawyer Los Angeles or 
tax uh, lawyer or whatever so our we have a really strong prioritization on uh, becoming visible in Google that's extremely important for us and then of course we would be looking to do uh, media partnerships in all the countries that we go into because we're looking kind of at uh, on a market basis like we're not going to become TripAdvisor who who kind of offers the whole world in one place we want to go into each and every single market because all of the legal markets are quite different from uh, even though there are lots of similarities there are also lots of different um, rules and regulations on how the legal industry is handled. So I think we have to adapt to every single market we go into. I'm excited to see the expansion. I'm excited to uh, see you roll into the States one day so I can say I interviewed Erling before he was <laughs> uh, a big hotshot in the legal platform space and, and you won't remember me then and you'll be like, who? This guy isn't worth my time. But before I let you go, what are some other changes or things that you see happening in the legal industry? And what I mean by that, as a serial entrepreneur, I imagine your brain is always going. You're always thinking about ways to better things and offer solutions where there are problems. What are some of the things you see occurring in this industry that may change over the coming years? Well, as we spoke about uh, in the beginning of this conversation, I do think that as lawyers, we are the next cab drivers, you know, all of the status and, 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 and uh, fancy gimmicks associated with the lawyer profession, it will be gone in 10 years, 100% sure, will be like cash tellers at um, Walmart, you know, it, it, there will be absolutely no status left in this field. Listen, lawyers are basically advanced robots you know people come to us tell us a problem and we try to program a contract to help them out and the fact is that 80 percent of the work and i'm speaking from my own experience 80 percent of the work that i did as a lawyer anybody could do um you didn't necessarily need a legal profession uh, legal uh, degree to do a lot of the stuff that we do it's simple contracts it's a lot of human counseling and psychology actually you have to comfort people. Um, there are so many th things that we do that's not directly related to the, the, the education that we hold. And the stuff that we do need education for, a lot of that can be done better by robots. So what will happen is that our profession, I'm 100% sure about this, it will be chopped into lots of small pieces with some people handling uh, like a kind of a legal secretary function that will do a lot of this and robots will do a lot of the contracts and stuff that we do. Also with the private moving into the industry, I do think that uh, they will drive costs down and prices down. Uh, so I think there will still be a definite uh, market for especially the large firms. <clears throat> um, because they're very rooted into the large corporations. You know, there's a reason why it's called to lawyer up. <clears throat> but I do think that a lot of the, the work that we do will be outsourced and taken over by robots, unfortunately. Do you th so I went to a conference two years ago on blockchain technology. And the reason I went, it was, it was in Chicago, Illinois. And the reason I went is because it was specifically focused on the insurance industry, which my practice works with a lot about how they're incorporating blockchain and smart contracts into their everyday practice and how they w envision that happening across the industry and across a lot of different uh, practice areas. Have you given that any, any thought? I know you, you're talking really about AI and some of the the uh, really sophisticated computer systems that can do some of this stuff. Do you, do you, have you thought about blockchain? Have you thought about the incorporation of that into the legal profession and how that may change things? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, smart contracts is extremely uh, interesting from a legal standpoint. I mean, it takes away all uncertainty about, uh, in a way, uh, the contract is supposed to be interpreted, right? Because it's going to be interpreted by a robot, basically. So you just press play and the contract is started or executed as according to the, to the plan. You know, there's so many uh, interesting uh, developments. I don't know if you heard about something called Chainlink. I have, yes. Yeah, so Chainlink is really interesting because it kind of 
it provides the necessary layer between blockchain and the real world. Uh, there are also some competitors, so I'm not pushing uh, Chainlink here, just to be <laughs> clear. <laughs> but it's, it's one of the one of them I looked closer at. And it's really interesting, like uh, Chainlink says, it's an API towards the, uh, towards the real world. So let's imagine you and I do a smart contract saying that if it rains in one year, um, the smart contract should release one blockchain, uh, one Bitcoin from your wallet to my wallet, right? And then you need some kind of way of communicating with the real world. And what uh, Chainlink does is it provides the link between the, the blockchain ledger and whatever API you want to pull into that. For, so for example, the weather channel or weather.com. So it just, it, it, you basically press play on the contract and one year later it checks, okay, is it raining? If yes, then release, um, then release the Bitcoin to Erling or Jonathan. So I think that's really uh, exciting. I agree. I, the way they described it at that conference is blockchain is like the superhighway and chain link are like the exits off of that, right? The exits being the, the little, the actual contracts or uh, agreements that are being made that are self-executing through the contract itself, but that plug into the superhighway, which is the, the blockchain to actually self-authenticate and, and to allow for these, uh, the verification process to, to evolve. I think there are very few people thinking about blockchain like you and I are, I think there are fewer people that actually have law degrees like you and I do thinking about blockchain. <laughs> I was the only lawyer at this convention, the only lawyer at this convention of, I think probably 500 people because mm -hmm. I don't think, to, to your point, backing all the way up to the beginning of our discussion and the, the word antiquated, I don't think people think these things are a reality, that they are going to change the way that this profession operates. And I'm glad that you are on the cutting edge and envisioning some of these things and creating a, a service that will only help. It's not going to detract from the legal work that is done. It's only going to provide a better connection between the consumer and the lawyer that's trying to do the legal work. And really, it levels the playing field, as you said, between the law firm that it's 100 years old and the lawyer who just got out of law school. Because now if they do good legal work, their reputation will allow them to acquire more clients and it won't be this, this, uh, this older thought process of, I have to go to a law firm that's been around for a long time for the sake of them being around a long time. You really get to uh, show off your skills and your abilities, which will supersede just the length of practice that a lot of lawyers can't make up for in any sort of quick amount of time. So. I think it's fascinating. Erling, I think what you're doing is incredible. I hope to see it here. I will be one of the first people to set up and subscribe and claim my profile. I welcome the negative reviews as well as the positive, as long as they're from actual clients because it only allows us to get better. Uh, please stay in touch. Please keep me posted on your progress. Good luck with your expansion in 2021. And um, I'd love to have you back as you guys make your way into the United States. That would be an absolute pleasure. And definitely, I'll keep you updated on the, right. on the progress. Thanks, Erling. Thank you so much. Bye.